We're going to continue looking at the issue of the believer's walk. And I want you to read with me beginning in Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 8. Where Paul says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful again for the day that we have. Thankful that Christ gives us light. And we pray for that light from the word this morning. In Christ's name, amen. We, uh, we're looking at the issue of light and darkness. This, this morning we, we, we read there quite a few verses, but I'm really wanting to key in on the issue of now that we're light, and you see in verse number 10, it says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now, um, last week we talked about that we were darkness. Do you remember last week we went, through, we went through three of four points that I wanted to make. I wanted to get to the fourth point and, uh, this morning, which is really the issue of how it is that we are to walk. Um, but before we get to the point of how we're to walk, we covered one per- point that says that we were darkness. Um, uh, Jim sang uh, the song this morning for the, for the, um, uh, during the collection that I was a guilty sinner, right? I was something else. I had an identity that was in darkness. But now that it says, now it says that ye are light. I pointed out to you last week that doesn't say that you as a guilty sinner are still a guilty sinner, but now you're in light. It's not like Christ took you, you're still your guilty same self, and put you into a room and turned the light bulb on, and now you are in light. That's not what the scripture says. It says that ye are light. There's a difference there. There's a difference between being in something and actually being something. You understand what I'm saying? There's a difference there between your surroundings and what you are. You see, your identity has been changed. Who you are has been changed. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that issue a little bit more. Uh, the, the, the issue, this whole identification, the issue in Scripture between light and darkness always is centering around this issue of the understanding and your knowledge and, and what it is that God has accomplished. And so when, when Ephesians says that ye are light, there's an issue of our understanding being enlightened. So we, we want to expound upon this issue. We want to expound upon how it is that we are to live now that we are like, now that we have this identity. But you're, do you remember what the third point that where we left off last week? You were darkness, ye are light, and the thing that I asked you is, how did you get there? <laughs> how did we get there? And we talked about the issue of the gospel and believing the gospel, and I made a logical pro- progression for you. I said that we were darkness, we are now light, that we, went to the, we saw that the scripture says that we are in Christ. In Adam there is darkness, but in Christ there is light, and that Christ is God. And then the, the scripture says that God is light, and in Him is no darkness. So that if you're in Christ, and Christ is God, and God is light, then ye are light, because you have God's Uh, identity. We are in God, therefore we are light. That's our new identity. And so with Ephesians chapter 5 in mind, I would like you to go back over to Acts chapter 26, which is which is where we left off. And I just wanted to to uh, to prime our discussion this morning and looking at God's word with one verse from the passage that we looked at. We're not going to go through the whole passage again, but in Acts chapter 26, there's an important There's an important verse for you to have at the forefront of your mind as we take the next step in our journey as we walk through this subject. In Acts chapter 26 and verse number 18, Paul is is recounting here, uh, he's he's giving a testimony to Agrippa of, of when he saw the light, and the light came to him, and how God saved Saul of Tarsus, 
and, and made him the apostle Paul and sent him to the Gentiles. And, and Paul is saying here that, you know, I saw the light, God saved me, and now I'm, I'm being sent to the Gentiles. And now I've, I've got a new message. And he says in verse number 18, the purpose for which he's being sent to the Gentiles. He says, uh, well, look back at verse number 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. That's what God said. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. You're going to be a witness unto them for me. He says in verse number 18, here's the purpose, Paul says, for which I, I, that, that Christ sent me, is to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You see, God is going to send Paul to the Gentiles to open their eyes spiritually, to give them spiritual life and to give them spiritual light and to take them from darkness into light and from the power of Satan unto God. How did they, get, how did they turn from darkness to light? That verse, that, you know, the, the whole issue of how did we go from darkness to light, it says there that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. You get, not only do you get your sins forgiven, but it's not like, you know, God wipes, wipes the slate clean. You know, you ever, what, what's that thing where you doodle on it and then you, you wipe it and then you can doodle on it again? Etch a sketch, thank you. You know, you just, you just doodle on it, wipe it clean, and then, oh, there's, there's more things on there. There's more dirt. There's more, you gotta, you gotta keep cleaning it over and over and over again. But God, when he died for your sins, and when you trust the gospel, he died for your sins that were past, present, and future. You don't have to wipe them clean again. And so you get your sins forgiven, and then you get an inheritance in God. And so you have this inheritance to look forward to, and your identity is changed from darkness to light. It's not one of these things where you have to live your life and be good enough, and when you get to the end, you see if you're good enough to be able to get this inheritance. You don't see if, if I get to the end, well, I, I have some light that has shown to me, and let's see if I can live in the power and strength of my own might to be a good person, to have good works before God, and maybe He will accept me if I'm good enough. That's not what the Scripture teaches. When it says that ye are light, ye are light because you have trusted the gospel. And then when you've trusted the gospel, the, well, if you, um, um, if you look over in, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, hold your place in Acts, look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at what Paul says here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4, it says, Paul says, But if our gospel be hid, in verse number 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world, who is that? Satan, that is your adversary. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. Is that light or is that darkness? There's the darkness. That have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look, there is a light of the gospel that has shined unto us, and then when we trust that, we become light, because we get Christ's identity. We're not just operating in some knowledge that we get, we have been changed. We have been changed from darkness to light. And the way that that comes about is the gospel. Now, how is it that you come to believe the gospel? Do you have to spend your life meditating and hoping that if you meditate hard enough that you might come to a point where you know something about the gospel and that you can believe it? Where does your faith in believing in the gospel come from? Someone preached unto you the gospel for you to believe it, right? Where did they get that information when they preached the gospel unto you? The word of God. The Word of God. So it is the power of the Word of God that comes shining forth and bursting into our hearts that allows us to be able to trust the Gospel. And when, when, when that light comes bursting forth on the scene, you know, just like a sunset that's coming over the horizon, do any of you have to drive east in the morning when you work? Or do all of you have a commute to the west? <laughs> if you have to have a commute to the east, 
and you look out your windshield, what do you have to do? You have to put the visor down. That light is just bursting forth. And the scripture says that, um, that Satan has blinded the minds of this world lest they believe the gospel because that light of the gospel is going to come bursting forth into your heart and into your mind when you hear it preached. And you have the opportunity to believe that and to pass from death unto life and from darkness unto light. That is why God sent Christ to preach. That He is the light, the light that has come into the world. They killed Him. They crucified Him. Israel didn't do what they were supposed to do. They didn't fulfill their, their purpose that God had for them. God cut off Israel. And God tells Paul, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles to, bring, to be a light unto them. You're going to bring the gospel unto them. And go, there's going to be light that shines unto them. Now, when we do that, we get this inheritance, right? And so Colossians talks about the inheritance of the saints. Do you know where Colossians says that the inheritance of the saints is? It says, in light. The inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what Paul says. And how does he do that? Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. How do we go from darkness into light? Friends, it is the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ shed His blood for our sins and He gives you that truth that there is a standard of righteousness and a standard of rightness that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for each of us. And when we trust that, we have the light that comes into us. We trust that not only do we get light, but then we become light. Now, I want to, I want to hammer this point home by going to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. How is it that we get put into the Lord Jesus Christ? Because um, it says, Now ye are light. Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 8 says that ye now are light. But where are you light? In the Lord, it says. You've got Romans 6. Do you have Romans 6 in one hand? Just, I asked you to keep uh, Ephesians 5. If you have it, just flip over there. I just want you to read the words so that the eyes of your mind gate can see them, with them, your, see them for yourselves. You see there in verse number 8 where it says, Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light. And there's not a period there. There's not a period. It says, Now are ye light in the Lord. If your identity is in Jesus Christ, you are not only in light, but ye are light. But in order to be light, you need to be in Christ. In Christ. How is it that you got in Christ? Well, we've talked about the believing of the gospel. But you're identified with Christ. And Romans chapter number 6 talks about that a little bit. In Romans chapter number 6, look at verse number 1. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. How did you get put into Christ? You became identified with Christ by being baptized into Christ, by being baptized into His death and in His resurrection. You are now dead to sin. When you were in sin, what were you in? Darkness. But now you're dead to that. And now you're alive unto God. And you're being baptized, you're, you're baptized to Christ. Romans 6 is important because here, it is here in Romans 6 that we learn that something has made us dead to sin. Now, my, I, I would propose to you that if, if the Christian world understood Romans chapter number 6, it would go a very far way to understanding how it is that then we ought to live. 
because the whole Christian world, uh, uh, let me not overgeneralize, there are many people in the Christian world that are trying to get you to do what you ought. Now, we don't disagree that there's a walk to be lived, but there are many in the Christian world who would have you to try to get you to live as you ought, to walk as you ought, by, by threat and by condemnation and by saying that you, can't, you shouldn't sin, so in the power of your own might, stop doing those things. But here in Romans chapter number 6, it says we are dead to sin. That because we're dead to sin, because of our positional identity, we're dead to sin. And if we're dead to sin, now we don't have to live like we were. Because that's not who we are. And so uh, if, if we're dead to sin, does that mean that we're only dead to sin if we no longer sin? Did you understand my question there? If the scripture says that you are dead to sin, and you worry about, well, maybe I have sin in my life that I haven't confessed unto God, and maybe if I died right now, maybe I wouldn't go to heaven. The truth of the gospel is, is that you're not good enough to go to heaven. If you were, that's, Christ wouldn't have had to have died for your sins. Christ would have, been, Christ would have died in vain if you could have worked yourself to heaven. But not only did Christ save you from your sin, He removed the sin from your account. And so the issue there is, is, if you are dead to sin, does that mean the only way I'm dead to sin is if I quit sinning in my life? That's not what Romans 6 is telling you, is it? It's saying that your old man is crucified. Your old man is dead. The sin, it's all dead. And what your spirit is alive unto God. And so when you, when you sin in the flesh, that sin is not held accountable. You're, you're dead to sin. And what Paul says is, you're dead to that. That's not who you are. That's your old man. It's been crucified. It's dead. And he says, why would you want to walk like someone you're not? Why would you want to do those things? So the issue there is, um, if we are dead to sin, does that mean we are only dead to sin if we no longer sin? No. It means, positionally, we've been given new righteous standing. We're dead to sin because we have a new identity in Christ. <laughs> That's who I am. I'm accepted in the Beloved. Now, this is not saying that you're dead to sin because you are expected to have perfect, sinless conduct in the flesh, right? Now that you've trusted the Gospel, that's great. Now go out and don't ever sin again and try to do that in the power and might of your own flesh. See how good that works out for you. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You're dead to sin because you're now in Christ, positionally speaking. How did you become identified with Christ, as Romans 6 says? It says that you were baptized into Jesus Christ. You know, baptism is an identification truth. Baptism is an identification truth. It means that baptism is not an outward sign of an inward change. Baptism shows who you're identified with. They were baptized in the wilderness unto Moses so that Israel would be identified with Moses. When the Lord Jesus Christ came in His earthly ministry saying that He's come, here's the Messiah, and Israel was to go out to repent of their sins and to be water baptized to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul comes over in Romans chapter number 6 and says that we're baptized into Christ. We're identified with Christ. But Romans 6 tells us we were baptized into Jesus Christ by being baptized into His death. His death. What did Christ die for? Our sins. What are we dead to? Sin. So that happened the moment you trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ that He died for your sins, and you trusted He died for your sins, you were baptized into His death by the Holy Spirit. That death, you trust that Christ died for your sins. That death that you trust, and then you become baptized into Christ, you become placed into Christ. You know that no bathtub baptizes you into His death? No amount of hydrogen and oxygen flowing over your fleshly body will baptize you into the death of Christ. That God, the Holy Spirit, 
is the only one that can baptize you into the death of Christ. That's why Ephesians, you know, we're, we're talking Ephesians and Romans is very closely related. So we're looking at Ephesians 5. We're coming over to Romans 6 to explain some of those truths. Over in Ephesians, there is only, there's one Lord, one faith, and how many baptisms? There's one Lord, one faith, and ten baptisms, right? No, there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So you have to figure out which is the one baptism. Is it water baptism or is it spiritual baptism? Scripture speaks of both. Don't take my word for it. Go and look for it. But when you look it out, ask yourself, how is it that you could be baptized into the death of Christ? There's no water in Romans chapter number 6. It can't get there because it doesn't have the ability to put you into Christ. If you try to make these verses out to be water, it's an insult to, to, to the cross work of Christ. Why is that? Because only what He did on the cross could make you dead to sin. To sit there and say that I could get in a tub of water and, and dunk myself in it and that that would make me dead to sin, that's, that's, that's not the truth. Only what He did on the cross could give you a new identity and put you into Christ. Only what Christ did could give us new life. Water baptism can't do that. And they need to stop pretending like it can. Because when they put the attention on water baptism, what does that take the attention off of? The cross work of Christ. It takes the attention off of Christ, and instead it puts it on themselves in their fleshly Jewish ritual that has no place for the body of Christ today. Not only is that a failure to rightly divide, it's a perversion of the truth and diminishes Christ. And if it is water baptism that does this, then it would be necessary for salvation, wouldn't it? It's a simple question. You know, people who say, believe in water baptism, it destroys the whole Baptist line. You go and ask the Baptist, do you water baptize? Yes. Why do you water baptize? Oh, it's an outward sign of an inward confession. Where is that in the scripture? I don't know. Just trust me. This is why we do it. Okay. Is it necessary for salvation? No, you don't have to get water baptized to be saved. You just water baptized to become a member of our church or, or whatever. But you should be water baptized to be obedient unto Christ. Well, my, 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 my statement here is that if you think that Romans... I'm, I'm just asking people to be consistent, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm just trying to have you think through the flow of their thought process. If Romans chapter number 6 is water, and you have to be water baptized to become dead to sin and be baptized into the death of Christ, is, would that be required for your salvation? Absolutely. If you're not baptized in the death of Christ, if you've not been baptized in that manner and identified with Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection, you have no resurrection hope. You're not dead to sin. You're still in your sin. Now we get this the moment we believe. That's what I'm telling you. The moment that we believe, the Holy Spirit comes and does this. But if you think that Romans chapter 6 is water, is that optional? It's not op it, wouldn't, it wouldn't seem to be optional, would it? Now, with this death is how we become dead to sin and how we become identified with Christ, put into Christ, and become light. When Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 8 says that ye are light in the Lord, how do you get in the Lord? Romans chapter 6 tells you. You need to trust the gospel and then you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into His death. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter number 5. Now that you know how that we get into Christ, because that's a, that's a very important point, and now that you know that we are light, what does the last part of, of, of Ephesians 5, 8 say? You were darkness, now you're light, now what? Walk. Walk as children of light. Your life matters. So I ask the question, how should we then live? Well, the scripture tells us that we should then, we should walk as children of light. If you are light, and if you are children of light, then you need to walk like who you are. Very simply, if I can just take a sidestep for it here, we're talking about light. I said at the very beginning that the issue between darkness and light is the issue between knowledge and understanding. And, and very simply, I'm going to, you know, kind of take the end and put it here and kind of, not build up to any climax, because I just want you to be very clear in what we're talking about. When you walk as light, the light comes from the Word of God. And so if you're going to walk as light, you're going to take the truth of God's Word and you're going to reckon it to be so. 
Now, very often I get up here because we're talking about something and we're talking about some spiritual truth and, and I'll, I'll mention about, well, how do you do that? And we'll talk about it's the power of God's word. And you may ask, well, practically speaking, Brandon, what does that mean? Okay, how, but, but what about that it's the power of God's word? Well, God's word tells you what is darkness and it tells you what is light. So then when he tells you to walk as children of light, you can read the instruction here and you can read some very practical things. For example, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 3. Um, if you, well, start back in verse number two because there's another issue of the walk there. We already covered uh, ch- uh, verse number two a couple of weeks ago. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But, so you're to, to walk in love, and we're going to walk in light as Ephesians 5, 8 tells us. Notice what it says in verse three. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. These things are not becoming of you because you're no longer darkness. Now you're light. So you would flee from fornication. And when Paul tells you in verse number eight to walk as children of light, here's a very clear thing. Do you need someone to tell you really what fornication is and all uncleanness or covetousness? Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. This is, it's not rocket science. When God says to walk as light, here's some things that are darkness. Guess what? You can go through Paul's epistles. You can find things that this is how the heathen walk. This is how the unsaved world walks. This is darkness. And then you have times where Paul is giving instruction and saying, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is, you know, these wholesome things, think upon these things. These things are good, right? There's a contrast between good and evil, what is light and what is darkness. And you have some very practical instructions in Paul's epistles on how it is then that we are to walk. Now, when you go back to Ephesians 8 and he says, walk as children of light, he goes through all of these things. He says, don't do these things because this is why the wrath of God is poured out upon the children of disobedience. That's why it's coming. He says, don't be partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now you're light. Walk as children of light. And when Paul says that, does that verse tell us that God is interested in how we now live? Absolutely. Absolutely. God forbid that anyone would ever come to those of us who believe in the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and what Christ did for us on the cross, and nothing of our works. God forbid that someone should come to us and say, well, you believe that you can live however you want, and it doesn't matter. That's not what we believe. But what we need to do is we first need to understand the issue of salvation first and then understand the issue of our walk. Because when it comes to, let's let's talk about after salvation, let's talk about our walk. Let's talk about walking as children of light. Now, if we know that fornication is darkness and that we shouldn't be doing these things if we're going to walk as children of light, that's the instruction on how we are to walk. What we are not to do is to take these things and bring them back over here and say, well, if if you sin, and if you do one of these things, then you're no longer saved, right? Now that's mixing the issue of your walk and how we ought to live with the issue of your salvation. That's confusion. Because the issue of your walk is separate and distinct from your salvation. The salvation occurs by putting your faith and trusting the gospel. Now you know... Just as, a, uh, as another <laughs> side point, you know when, when, when the camp that comes along and wants to tell you that you can lose your salvation if you still sin? You notice which sins they pick out to be the ones that can cause you to lose your salvation? By the way, they'll never give you an exact list, right? 
It's always whatever they say or whatever their preference is. Usually if you've got a dogmatic pastor in a church and these are the things that you ought not to do and if you've done them, then you're backsliding. Well, it's, it's pretty easy to say, you know, something along uh, murder or fornication. You know, if you commit murder or you commit adultery, then, then you know, you've lost your salvation. Well, what about, what about uncleanness? What about covetousness? What, what about those things? What about the idolater in verse number five? I'll oh, see, we don't want to get there because they know that they're guilty of being covetousness at times, right? It's easy for them to say that I've never cheated on my wife and that I'm not an adulterer, but they don't go to Christ's standard of fornication. They don't go to the, the mind gate of the eye, right? They go to the operation of the flesh. Why? Well, looking to puff, puff themselves up in the flesh. So my point being here is, when we're talking about the walk and how we ought to live, I hope you understand that as grace believers, there's a difference between your salvation and your walk. Do you know that everybody who's a, you know, a, a grace believer from the moment that they believed and had salvation and had their sins forgiven, you know not everyone has a perfect walk after that point? Do you know sometimes people stumble and they fall? You know sometimes sin gets a hold of them and comes into their life? Does that mean that they're not saved? Or does that mean that Paul is imploring them not to be a partaker of those things because it, it would be possible for you to be? But Paul says, don't do it. Why, are we that, why, why should we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? You understand Paul's making the argument that it is possible, but why would you do that? First of all, it's not pleasing unto God. He should be your primary focus, right? But second of all, um, it's, it's not good for us. So I, I wanted to make that distinction just to be clear because we're trying to, I'm trying to be a bit more practical here and understanding how is it that we should then live and, and what does that mean? And if I just come along and say um, that it is the power of the Word of God that takes us from light to darkness, it's because that's the gospel and then how is it that we should then live is found in the Word of God. We, we know these things, but then you can go and read those things. Yeah, and you understand that they're there. Now, um, how do we live godly? How do we live godly? Do you go home? Do you sit down and write out your own Ten Commandments and put them on a list and say, these are the rules that I have to live by? Turn over to Titus chapter number 2. Well, the thing is, is that, first of all, you couldn't live godly in your flesh you couldn't come up with your own standard. And if you did, what type of motivation would you be giving yourself? One of fear, right? Because if you broke it, then you're condemned. So there's an issue of how do we live godly, and I hope that you have heard this verse before, and I hope that it's in your frame of reference. In Titus chapter number 2, in verse number 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. So the grace of God teaches us something. The grace of God isn't just a get out of jail free card where your sins are forgiven and now go and live however you want because God doesn't care. That's not what Paul says. Now that you've been saved by grace, understand what it is that the will of God is. We'll get to that in a moment. We'll look at that a little bit further. But before we get to that in a bit more detail, what is it that helps us get there? What is it that bridges the gap? What is it that, that, that gives us the understanding for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Look, at, at the risk of, of beating a dead horse, <laughs> do you see there where it's the grace of God that brings salvation? You have salvation. Now once you have it, what is it that grace teaches us? You see, grace is not something that teaches us that you have to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and then once you deny those things, then the grace of God will bring you salvation, because then you will have earned it. You see, if that was the case, then grace would no longer be grace. But then you would have earned the wages of it, and grace would have become debt. But notice the, the, the order in which this verse goes. It is the grace of God that brings salvation, and then it starts to work in you teaching us 
that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. This is the great dissension among believers. I don't think that we as Christians, and what I'm talking about now is the two camps on, I think you understand what I'm saying, hopefully you understand what I'm saying. (laughs) And then there's the camp of those people who would say that, well, um, we have to do these things in order to be saved, right, or along those lines. You see, we don't, the two camps don't, do not disagree on how we should live. You understand what I'm saying? Both camps are agreeing that we should live godly lives. The disagreement comes into which path can we take that will get us there to be able to live a godly life that's pleasing and acceptable unto the Lord. And so the other, the other camp would say that, um, that do we do it by walking in the flesh or do we do it as by walking in the Spirit? Do we do it by putting ourselves under a law and by giving ourselves enough rules and teaching our flesh to try to put our flesh under subjection to then be able to live righteously? You see, I think in their failure to rightly divide, they failed to learn the lesson that Israel taught us. That if they could have put their flesh under subjection, Israel would have been able to do it a long time ago. But the law doesn't work that way. What we see from Titus chapter number 2 is that grace is our teacher. If you want to know how to live, you should look to grace to be able to teach you. What does grace teach us to deny? There's two things here. Grace teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Now, if you just think about that and think about it in very general terms, it's the grace of God that teaches us to deny everything that is not God-like, everything that is ungodly, everything that is ungodlike, we're supposed to deny that. Why does grace teach us that? Well, grace teaches you that you are now in God. You're now in Christ. And now this is your position. This is your standing. And so Paul goes through a lot of things of teaching you that you shouldn't walk this way because this is not who you are. And so when you know who you are, that's the first thing that you need to get straight, right? You need to know who you are and who Christ has made you, who you are now. And when you understand those things, then you'll understand the things that you shouldn't be, right? If you understand that you're supposed to be holy and without blame before God in love, and that you're to be pure, and you, you read through these things, and then if someone comes along and asks you, should you commit adultery? I, I know I'm using an easy one, right? But, oh, oh, no, I shouldn't do that. That's ungodlike. That's ungodly. I should deny that. So you have the ungodliness, which is dealing with, with God and who He is, and I think about that in the in the heavenly sphere and what he's done for us. But then not only are we to deny ungodliness, but what else are we to deny? Worldly lusts. So we're to deny, deny the, other, the things that are ungodly and we're also supposed to deny the things that appeal to your flesh. Worldly lusts. Carl spoke about some of those things in Sunday school this morning. That we're to deny those things because they're worldly. Those things are fleshly. Now, are you a fleshly being or are you a spiritual being? If you've trusted the gospel and received spiritual life, now you're dead unto sin. You're, you're de- you're, you know who you were in Adam, you're dead. Now you're alive unto Christ. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm going to deny the things of the world because this is counter to God and this is not who I am. God's given me this to live in. I'm going to go and live in this glory and manifest His light. Deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. 
in order to do that. You know, if I told you, Jim, go build a car, but I didn't give you any instruction on how to do it, it'd be pretty tough, right? So when Paul says to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, he then tells you what those things are, so that way you can identify them. You can identify what they are to know that you shouldn't be those things, because you can't deny something unless you first know what it is. Then once you were able to identify those things that are ungodly, now that you are in Christ and are a part of God and, and should not partake of the ungodliness, once you know what those ungodly things are, you can say, no, that's not who I am. There's no need for me to partake in that. I'm already accepted in the beloved. I'm already blessed. I've been given grace. Why would I do that? There's no benefit to me. I've got spiritual blessings. Why would I want any you know, physical you know, to, to, to partake of the, the lusts of this world? That would just be living like who I was before. And how much joy did that bring me? There's joy in sin for a season, but then what happens at the end of the season? The joy is gone. You're left bankrupt, devoid, and I'm not talking financially. I'm talking about emotionally, spiritually speaking. You have nothing. So this world without Christ is devoid of that which it seeks for. And it tries to replace that void with everything but Christ, doesn't it? But you first need to know what those things are before you can avoid them. Look at Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3. Titus 3.3 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, How's this for some very practical advice on what's ungodly? <laughs> deceived? If you're deceived, what's that dealing with? Your knowledge and understanding, right? We're talking about the things of the light and how you know and how you operate and how you're deceived. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures, you're going about to serve your, your flesh rather than to serve God and to do that which is right living in malice and envy, hateful, because that's what sin is going to produce in your life, and hating one another. Why? Because you don't even know what love is. Look, in, unless you know Christ, you don't know what love is. God is love. So you can do your best. And I, I, I've told you before, and I'll say it again, there are unsaved people who can love. Why? Because they have the testimony of believers that they've seen in their life of how that love is to operate. To be a self-sacrificial love. You see, that love only comes from Christ. That love, you, you don't read Islam telling you to be self-sacrificial, do you? Uh, you see, this, this is true love. This is, this is looking out for one another. This is loving one another. And it says, hateful and hating one another. But after that kindness and, and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, oh, there is love. I was in hatred, and then the light shined in the darkness, and I, I see what it is that I need. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, there goes your works out the window, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. There's the Holy Spirit coming into play, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men. Now, I'm guilty of, of not getting to uh, Romans 12 where I want to get and where we will go next week. So I will leave you with this thought as we're going to segue and can talk, talking about next week about what it is that's pleasing unto God and, and continuing to talk about walking and your walk and your walk in life. Can I leave you with one thought here in, in Titus chapter number 3? 
Notice what he says in verse number 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men, unto, unto men. My point being there is that when you talk about what it is to walk in light and to walk in Christ, that's going to be based upon the truth and knowledge and understanding of God's Word working in your life. Right? If you don't know what the ungodly things are, if you haven't read those things, if you don't have them in your inner man as a reference, you're not going to have that light. You need to read God's Word. You need to get that working within you. And then for you to go out and walk in light and deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, the way that you're going to do that, verse number 8, one of the ways that's going to help you, we're going to, we're going to talk about more things next week, but I want you to look there at verse 8. He says, These things I will that thou affirm constantly. Look, let me tell you that your Christian walk isn't a piece of cake. You don't trust the gospel and then all of a sudden you know exactly what it is to walk as a mature spiritual saint. That just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen that way. You see, in order for you to walk as children of the light, you need to affirm the things that are right constantly in your mind. There's a lot of things that go into your mind. And you need to be able to reject those things which are ungodly and you need to be able to evaluate the things which are good and which are right and to affirm them constantly. And by the way, how do you evaluate those things? By what standard? That is the Word of God. And he says, you affirm those things constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to do what? Maintain good works. You see, when you live with that right, with the light in your mind and with the right thinking and understanding what is good and what is right from God's Word, and you affirm those things constantly in your mind and you continue to walk this walk down here in the Spirit, obeying the spiritual things, bringing your mind into the reality of who you are in Christ, when you affirm these things constantly, then you maintain good works. Because then you do that which is good and acceptable in the eyes of God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the standard that you've given us. And as we talk about these practical things about our life, we want to make sure that we understand the first and the primary thing it's the salvation that's offered to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the shedding of His blood on Calvary's cross to save each and every one of us from our sins. And it's only then at that point, Father, that we understand how much You truly loved us. And once we receive that forgiveness, Lord, out of, out of love, we are motivated to bring forth fruit to live a life that's pleasing unto you and to walk as children of light. I pray that each and every one of us will esteem that free gift of salvation as we ought and to esteem Christ as we ought and use that as our motivating factor for how we live this life that now is. In Christ's name I pray, amen.